Hi, my name is Daniel Dimoski, and for the past, let's say, 15, 16 years, I've been a math and physics tutor. I also now tutored uh, other subjects like programming, a little bit of uh, basic chess trainings, but for the most part, I tutored the math and physics. At first, one-on-one -on -one live sessions, then I also started doing uh, online uh, tutoring and I, for the most part, I would say that I was very successful and that my methods of approaching uh, my students uh, were very successful, very good uh, um, feedback from my students and uh, very positive results. But, it, but in the last um, three, four years or more, I started encountering uh, difficulties with uh, younger students difficulties that uh, manifested in them increasingly more not being able to focus on uh, tasks uh, maybe sometimes not understanding how to approach uh, problem solving especially when it comes to math problems N um, and uh, not being able to sustain prolonged periods of uh, solving uh, um, and uh, calculating problems. I kind of uh, wanted to understand and because it's, it is necessity for me in order to be able to know how to react to it, how to do my job better. All that made me do um, a larger and relatively extensive uh, study on the young, uh, let's say, smart for teenage uh, generation. And um, I wanted to start th this presentation, kind of a documentary presentation in here with uh, the video from Jen uh, Trench and this TEDx presentation and then from then on I will connect it with other studies and videos that are correlated to this larger study. So we are going to skip a little bit and go into the video because I already took enough time with, uh, with my introduction but uh, this is a good point to start this video. Then there's iGen. If you're iGen, don't just hold up your hold up phone and let's have our iGen app. So <laughs> almost all of you have a phone and almost all of them are smartphones. iGen is the first generation to spend their entire adolescence with smartphones and that has had ripple effects across many areas of their life and that is also the top of my book called iGen. So how do we know how generations differ from each other? For the most part, it's by asking teens. Tell us about their experience, how they're feeling. In large national surveys that are done every year. Several of them go back all the way to the 70s. That's a powerful method because it allows us boomers, Gen X, millennials, and I at the, when they were young. What's gener cultural change apart young? They are very large, all told. They add up to about 11. So I've been doing studies on generation for about 25 years. So I got used to changes that would grow slowly and steadily over time. But then around 2010 or 2011, I started to see changes that were much more sudden. I had really never seen anything like it. So for example, teens became less likely to go out without their parent as off. They were getting together with their friend less off. More started to say that they felt left out or that they felt lonely. More started to say they felt like they couldn't do anything right, that their life wasn't that they joy life. A national screening study found a 50% increase in major depressive order 2011 among teens. Major depressive disorder with Hairman. Most concerning of all, suicide rate 12 year old has doubled since 2007. I think this means we have to ask the question, why? What happened between 2010 and that might have caused trends? So one answer to what happened is that this happened. You might have your own memory, time around 2011 or 2012, of being in a public place, looking up, realizing that everybody else found. Percentage of America owned a smartphone, cross sent 12. By far the largest change lies since 2010 has been that more of them got smartphones, spent more time online, and on see the time sequence here. Here's teen depression, smartphone ownership, the number of uh, number of hours per day spend online. On the other, economic factors don't line up. So unemployment, for example, was actually going down over this time that teen depression going up. So the next question, are teens who spend a lot of time online thriving or are they struggling? Well, they're more likely to not sleep enough. They are 71% more likely to have one risk factor, suicide, 
such as, such as feeling sad or hopeless in weeks, thinking about suicide or having attempted suicide in the past, and they are twice as likely to be unhappy. There's a photographer who takes pictures of people on the street who are looking at their phone. In short, they do not look happy. They do not look happy. Here's the good news. You don't have to give up your phone. Use your phone, all the great things that it for an hour or two a day, and then go and live your life. Go for a run or a swim. Watch a sunset. Get some sleep. Go see a friend. Not on Snapchat, but in person. Watch the expression on your friend's face. Hear the tone in your friend's voice. Give your friend a hug. In short, let your phone be a tool, you, not a tool. That, thank you very much. Okay, so that study by Jen Twenge about uh, iGen generation or smart word generation was study from five, six years ago. And meantime, we had COVID and pandemic. And uh, during that period, most schools adopted online uh, um, Zoom conference uh, call uh, study where entire classrooms were uh, switched from face to face, which wasn't possible during a large portion of uh, 2020, 2021. And they were switched until the vaccine came and switched to online learning. And there are studies that say that Zoom e learning wasn't as successful even as studying in the classrooms, face-to-face -face classrooms were until then. So whatever the data uh, showed in the Gen 20 study, uh, the, the condition the, it got worse uh, during the corona and the kids got more, even more addicted to the cell phones. So her visual thinking didn't help so much, but I just wanted to get back to that video because I think it was very important and wanted to connect to this. Now we are in 2023 and to the most part we're post-COVID and kids were back to schools. But I also wanted to, to mention this because all of this thing, things, the smartphone that study by Jan Punch, this study by Luis Antonio Yo Joya or Yoya and Manuela Lorenzo about this is obviously about uh, Brazilians, uh, public schools and so on, but I think it's applicable to most of uh, uh, Zoom conference call kind of e-learning classrooms, whether it's in Brazil, United States or wherever, because it, it's much, much uh, harder to be a teacher and go from face to face to, to be, to have an interaction which you don't have when you don't have students and you kind of watch each and every one of them. It's much harder uh, um, to do that in a uh, conference call than to do it when you're in a uh, classroom. You can go through the classroom and then you can engage with each and every student separately, which is a lot different when you're doing a conference call and a learning study. So the next thing in this series of videos that I think are correlated and connected, and I think I'm very good is this associative thinking because all those things may make a large kind of a puzzle. So it's important how you connect and how you connect uh, data and findings from each and every study and so how they are correlated together and you can make and, uh, and create a larger picture out of all of those parts. So next study I would like to invoke is uh, actually a cognitive model of development uh, by uh, and constructivist uh, kind of uh, educational theory by Lev Vygotsky, and I'll be showing a presentation soon. Okay, so now we're learning about socio-cultural theory by uh, Lev Vygotsky. What we're actually learning is about constructivism, and constructivism is a theory theory in education, and it is an approach to teaching and learning based on premise that cognition is result of mental construction. In other words, students learn by fitting new information together with what they already know. Constructivists believe that learning is affected by context in which an idea is taught, as well as by students' belief, beliefs and attitudes. The learner actively imposes organization and meaning on the surrounding environment and constructs knowledge in the process. The teacher's role is not only to observe and uh, assess, but to also engage with the students 
while they are completing activity, wondering aloud and posing questions to the students for promotional reasoning. Okay, a little bit about the uh, author. Vygotsky was uh, someone who was called, proclaimed the master of uh, psychology. He was born in uh, 1896, uh, same year as his colleague Piaget from France, both kind of... Uh, theorized in the same way about constructivism. He was born into a middle-class Jewish family from a Russian town of Orsha, and he entered the private all-boys secondary school known as a gymnasium that uh, existed, the secondary school that prepared students for university. In 1913, entered Moscow University through lottery because there was only only quota for Jewish uh, students. In December of 1917, he graduated from Moscow University with a degree in law. Um, he completed about 270 scientific articles, numerous lectures, and 10 books based on a wide range of uh, Marxist-based psychological and teaching theories. He died on June 10, 1934, at the young age of 37, after a long battle with uh, TB tuberculosis. Vygotsky's work didn't become known in the West until uh, 1958 and was not published there until 1962. So, what exactly is this uh, socio-cultural theory? And which says that uh, it didn't focus on the individual child, but on the child as a practice of environment, as a, through social interaction, especially with adults, with adults, with parents and teachers, and focus on dyadic interaction. That is, child being taught by a parent how to perform some culturally specific action rather than uh, on child by himself. So, which means his child is. In, uh, influenced and being taught within a system, within an environment. Social word mediates child's cognif- cognitive development. Cognitive development occurs as child's thinking is molded by society in the form of parents, teachers, and peers. This leads to peer t- tutoring as a strategy in classrooms. People's thinking differs uh, dra- uh, dramatically between cultures because different cultures stress different things. Ch- ch- children construct their knowledge. Knowledge is not trans- transferred past but is personally constructed. It's just not outpouring like you, you listen to somebody. No, it needs to kind of build up like uh, like building blocks into what he knows in uh, from a simple, very uh, most basic uh, kind of a structure into more complex as he build up on that structure. And learning is mediated. All we all always have somebody who, who is uh, that one who is uh, kind of a mentor but also somebody who is more knowledgeable cognitive development there is is not direct result of activity but is indirect other people must interact with the learner use mediatory tools to facilitate the learning process and then cognitive development may occur language plays a central ro- uh, role in mental development I mean, we can talk about, like, I can talk more about language here, but I can uh, talk, like, um, more differently or in a, a evolutionary sense, but there's also um, a theory by Chomsky and what Chomsky propagates, you know, Chomsky, uh, uh, experts in, in uh, neurolinguistics or linguistics, who says, like, wherever you put the child, it has an innate... Uh, um, system within it, it will pick up where uh, the language of uh, community and accent uh, from a local local accent from wherever you put it. If you put a Chinese a kid in America or an American kid in China or Africa, whatever, put baby wherever it is, it will uh, pick up the, the language uh, from that uh, specific area. Uh, in question. So, most significant sociocultural tool is language as it used to teach tool use and it's vital in the process of de- developing uh, higher psychological function. Also, uh, each language has its, its own specific logic, if that makes sense. That's my personal edit to this. Now, there's a theory of principles and concepts. Learning appears uh, twice. First on social level and later on the individual level. First between people, which is kind of a sort of interest psychology, and then inside the child, because child needs to develop its, in, <clears throat> its inner kind of a talk. It needs to uh, at first talk to itself, but then develops inner speech, kind of. Development cannot be separated from its uh, social context. The concept, context needed for learning is that where the where the learners can interact with each other and use the new tool. This 
means that the learning environment must be authentic, that it must contain type of people who would use these types of tools as concepts, language, and symbols in a natural way. So this is an, a very uh, important uh, important concept to, uh, within this uh, socio cultural theory of within the constructivism uh, um, educational theory zone of proximal the development of a zpd it's the difference between what a child can do independently and what the child needs to help what where uh, what the child needs help with uh, with uh, from a more knowledgeable person to do okay and th those are two different kind of uh, sets of learning and there's a distance between actual and potential knowledge zpd Zone, and that zone between a potential knowledge and actual knowledge is the zone of proximal development. Potential with, w w between the potential and actual kind of uh, level, let's say, of, of knowledge or whatever. Two children with the same actual knowledge travel different distances to their potential knowledge, uh, therefore different uh, ZPDs or zones of proximal development. Was this clear enough? I am not sure if I understand, but whatever. I guess in the comments of the video or on YouTube when it was, it will be uh, whoever is there will comment. Okay, this is an example of how ZPD can work in the life of child. Like all children, uh, Momen is uh, constantly learning and exploring uh, the world around you. I guess that's the name, is how you interact with your environment, what you can... Uh, uh, take from it actively and this is another one you see that, that you use I, I guess this is a game boy or a tetris and how it learns f from uh, cards or, or so for game theory also has uh, its um how you say um example here it says moment like that boy has developed skills and knowledge that enable him to play a variety of games for each game he's able to successfully strategize and solve problems independent oh this is another example whereas in the f previous example he was on its own and trying to learn on its own you have a, a single uh, some uh, somebody who is more experienced and more knowledgeable or older b b brother or an older boy somebody in your environment who can teach you tricks or how to play and whatever. This is a card game Yu-Gi-Oh! And older brother plays it better, therefore he teaches him how to play. He will learn how to play, but he is unsure where to start. So he needs a structure for somebody who is more knowledgeable uh, than he is. Okay, so he finally, this is an example, how it works in a life of a child. He asks his brother for help. The brother agrees, working with, uh, learning with the games, and then he's learning in, uh, what, in the region what Vygotsky called zone of proximal development. And this is what it is. Like potential, th there's a potential, but you have to break from what is potential into what's actual, like practically. It's kind of like a, a difference between theory, like when you theorize, when you actually play the game. Even though you know the rules, you need to, to explore all the cases. Like once the game starts, you're learning to play. You're not just, even if you know all the rules, you need experience to actually play on each specific case in order to learn the game. In Zoro Proximal Development, he is doing something that requires help of somebody more capable. Without help of the brother, he would be unable to play. Therefore, even though you have cards, you need somebody like th this is a type of knowledge that you cannot learn by your own. Like you won't be tested. Same like example, if uh, a, no a younger kid wouldn't be, uh, would start to play a game like basketballs and that functions like within the uh, uh, area where he needs to learn from somebody like a father figure or a older brother and then he explains him how to play the same principle eventually the, the boy will learn the game well enough to play the, by himself but in first he needs instruction from somebody who is more knowledgeable and so on i think yeah i think we now he is the one who has more experience uh, he is teaching the, the sister how to play i guess okay another next concept is coupled in the role of teachers and other in supporting the learning development and providing support structures to get the next stage or level a knowledgeable participant can create by uh, by means of speech and support condition in which the student novice can participate in and extend current skills and knowledge to a higher level of competence. In an educational context, however, scaffolding is the instructional structure whereby the teacher models the desired learning strategy or task then gradually shifts responsibility to the students. Okay, scaffolding uh, 
provides support, extends the range of what learning can do, allows the learner to accomplish tasks uh, uh, otherwise impossible, used only when needed. Example, example of scaffolding in the classroom setting could include a teacher first instructing her children or how to write in a sentence using commas and conjunctions. As the week uh, goes on, she has uh, her students practice with uh, writing these sentences with peers, gives students feedback, and eventually has the kids to complete the skills without her guidance. And we have comparison with, with between uh, Vygotsky and Piaget. Piaget is another theory test and uh, um, within the wider um, theory of constructivism. Their theories of uh, constructivism and education uh, and the cognitive development of a child are similar, where, but Vygotsky is more uh, um, emphasis on a contextual uh, socio-cultural learning and uh, use of language what while uh, Piaget kind of uh, uh, ignores those kind of concepts within his own theory. So Piaget saying thinking develops uh, in co recognizable stages which depends on natural maturation, role of teacher important but use of more expert other not central which I actually don't agree. That's why I'm, it's important to, to mention, the, like to compare these two, but I think like for my own sake, uh, I am more with Vygotsky than I'm with uh, Piaget. Readiness is uh, is central concept in education. Children need to be ready to progress in their learning. Whereas with uh, Vygotsky, children should be actively encouraged to move through ZPD zone of proximal development. Do not need to be ready, but should be given opportunity to, to engage in problems which are beyond current level of ability, but within the zone of proximal development. And he says use more expert others seen as fundamental part of cognitive development. So and development to thinking is dependent upon language and culture. Whereas within Piaget, it doesn't recognize his language as central to to uh, cognitive development. So Piaget, Piaget scaffolding not a key concept. Language reflects level of cognitive development, but uh, with uh, Piaget, but it's not the same kind of understanding of what language does. Language is central with Vygotsky and helps to develop cognitive abilities. Without language is a lot, uh, lot uh, harder. This theory, uh, okay, Piaget's theory was influential in education, but has need uh, revising and uh, underestimation of children's ability is still a problem. This theory is more influential by Vygotsky's theory is more influential in education. Implementation, a clear application of socio-cultural theory principles in second language classroom is obvious in the task-based approach. This approach emphasizes the importance of social and collaborative aspects of learning. Socio-cultural theory focuses on how the learner uh, accomplishes a task and how the interaction between learners can scaffold and assist in the second language acquisition process. And uh, It's a citation by Turuk, uh, 2008. And recent technological advances have affected the application of uh, constructivist theory in practice, innovative uh, interaction in terms of computer software programs allow students to synthesize the course material through active learning despite some minor disadvantages i would say that it is minor i, I would say that the use of technology actually kind of impends and kind of uh, derails um, language acquisition and language development which kind of actually can uh, in a way retard uh, cognitive development as language uh, develops less if the, you don't write with a pen and if you only use for typing the, the cell phone and so other kind of, uh, there is a, a sort of a theory you know, or even something like th that is, uh, 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 that certain scientific paper is uh, touched and I, I, I don't have it right me, with me at the moment, is that through writing, uh, brain is more developed, like more neural synapses are uh, accomplished. And I think I cannot recall the paper that I know that I read about it and it, it's in, it was a peer-reviewed paper. So despite some allows interaction with others it would normally be inaccessible through distance education web uh, courses, but I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about something else. So 
Conclusion, social cultural theory considers learning as semiotic process where participation in socially mediated activities is essential. Theory regards instruction as crucial to cognitive development in the classroom. Instruction should be geared towards one of proximal uh, development that is beyond the learner's actual developmental level. Social in, uh, instruction actually produces new elaborate advanced psychological processes that are unavailable to the organism working in isolation. And this is kind of connects to the previous kind of uh, the, the the faults or how you say um, certain things that, that can be learned. And when you don't have a direct physical one on one live um, interaction between the student and, and a teacher, and if you have a, a a teacher that only interacts online, then kind of a, um, that I think that that Vygotsky would say that that uh, such online um, kind of a study or a classroom is lacking and the zone of proximal development and the kind of a cohesion of learning online is like retarding kind of a um, constructivist social cultural learning and the zone of proximal development is actually it doesn't allow the direct interaction between a student and a teacher and a, and a more uh, kind of a personal uh, or more intimate level to to say like that okay we see references and uh what i wanted to see is turk relevance and implication of vygotsky social uh cultural theory in the second language classrooms and we have a uh, vang lee uh, from 2006 social cultural learning theories and informational literacy teaching activities in higher education reference in user services quarterly volume 47 we have many uh kind of uh references uh, th that were that were here but you can also find the construct activism and on, on its own on YouTube, we can find many kind of uh, different and uh, more, how you call it, good books and articles online and uh, and for, further learn because this was a very basic kind of introduction to Vygotsky's uh, sociocultural theory. Okay, so from here on, in light of this, I would like to connect to two other videos which one would be about theory of history of uh, of um, mandatory uh, education pub mandatory public education and and another would be about kind of a culture industry by Adorno and Hochheim, how they kind of connect with this kind of a piece of a puzzle that binds together into more uh, a bigger picture and a bigger understanding of all the factors that are interwoven and connected within how uh, teenagers study, uh, how they are affected by, by education, by, by culture, by, by everything around them. Okay, so I was about to actually make a video and show entire video from a YouTube channel of World Bank on a state of global learning poverty, as you can, as you can see on the screen. But I, in the end, I decided not to show it because actually I don't... Uh, well, I actually can uh, in... in uh, as I, uh, I can uh, um, agree with the data, raw data that what is meant by global learning poverty, by learning poverty is that um, kids age 10 or, or less um, cannot read and comprehend like um, a regular story that was uh, adopted for uh, education of a 10 year old and meaning that 70% now in 2022, 23, 70 percent of, of kids globally of 10 years, of, of, of uh, age of 10 cannot read and comprehend what they read, uh, accompanying an uh, appropriate story for a 10 year old, which is a terrifying statistic, which also states that many countries uh, due to COVID, uh, weren't able to yeah, uh, make that kind of a Zoom assisted uh, web conference uh, call to sim simulate e-learning and e-classroom, online classroom, Wh while also uh, admitting that th that kind of a Zoom conference call uh, classroom online was also 
uh, highly ineffective as we uh, saw in a previous uh, previous uh, study video that was shown uh, in uh, that article by Brazilian uh, Brazilian education uh, statisticians or people who uh, made that peer review article that I presented. But I, of course, I don't want to give a promotion to somebody who is funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and so on for many reasons, because some kind of a globalist kind of agenda here is not something uh, I side with uh, I, what I side with. Therefore, at, in the end, I decide not to. But I, I do agree about uh, terrifying statistics. Another thing, so another video that I could have shown, or that there is a data here, is that Americans are reading fewer books than in the past. And I think it's also worldwide, and not just Americans, Europeans, also due to uh, rise of addiction with uh, uh, mobile phones and uh, with smartphones and with social media, more people are consuming more of video material on uh, YouTube, TikTok and other social media and are reading less books than ever. And statistics don't look that bad. So this is number of books uh, as compared to 1990 and 1999. And then you have, I don't think, you, you see it like in 2021 is 12.6, which is the worst uh, statistics uh like number of, um, average number of books per um, per capita here, which you can see because it's uh, cut in the in the OBS here with me and uh, other stat statistics here. Again, you cannot see 2021 like the lowest figures for 2021, also due to a uh, pandemic as well. But I think it it was declining even before pandemic. So this is. Uh, some statistics for for adults like all kind of a uh, sort of declines are appearing and that's a gallup uh, article here news.gallup.com and it's uh, article uh, title is americans reading fewer book, uh, books than ever in the past and also that's statistics like i wanted to show both statistics but also i want to share a uh, uh, older video not this one but this one, why write penmanship in the 21st century, where I think uh, the presenter here, Jake Weidman, is presenting also a very defeating uh, statistics, and this was eight years ago already. For on. so this probably is a presentation from 2015, where it says that our reading with a pen, not electronic pen, with a regular pen, and re uh, not reading, writing on a, uh, with a pen and on a paper, and uh, our um, penmanship uh, and writing skills as if writing an idea or a concept or an essay like we are uh, progressively or regressively we are regressing in a, a big way than than any times in our history so i will just like with the a slight introduction uh of, about the articles, previous article and previous video, I didn't want to show this. Uh, this video I'll show, and then I'll com uh, shortly comment uh, uh, after that. It's not a battery or a motherboard. So let me start from the beginning. But a pen is a, a simple thing, isn't it? It doesn't have a battery or a motherboard. It doesn't require a service plan or a satellite orbiting the Earth in order to function. It's never smarter than you are, which I like. And if you were to drop it in water or any distance higher than your own knee on a hard surface, it would not be destroyed. In fact, purchasing an insurance plan for it would be, well, silly and slightly ridiculous. Yet, this simple pen has shaped the very world in which we live. It has recorded the discoveries of scientists and inventors. It has charted the course for nearly every explorer who has braved the open ocean or explored the vast terrain. Wars have begun and ended at its way. And the doctrine of nearly every one of the world's religion was inscribed at its tip. It has recorded the genius of composers, artists alike, and more lovers have succumbed at its 
than any. You see, more than a pen, this is a vital part of our humanity. It is the facilitator to genius, the strongest weapon in wartime. The baton passed from one generation to the next. Needle on the Richter scale of our heart connects God. And yet, for the first time in history, the value of this amazing tool hang in the balance. With 41 out of 50 states no longer requiring handwriting to be a fundamental part of their curriculum, like everything else in our culture, we declare its value by what we teach, not our children. Yet I stand before you today not only as an advocate for the pen, but as your advocate as well. For while the hand empowers the pen, pen powers the man. Empower yourselves today and write this down. Use this and you will develop not one, but three forms of literacy. The first form of literacy is that of historical literacy. You see, we have a vast chronology of handwriting because man has been writing by hand for literally thousands of years. And every culture, every time period, every nation has had its own form of handwriting and they are each as unique as one individual's is another. Now while I could regale you with a vast background on each one of these forms, let me bring things a little bit closer to home and bring you more quickly up. This is America's first style of pen and the forefather of curse. It is called Spencerian script, created by Platt Rogers Spencer in the middle of the 19th century when he was only 13 years old. Not only did this boy create one of the most dynamic forms of penmanship known to man, he also had a beautiful philosophy and even theology behind his handwriting. You see, he believed that God, being the originator of all beauty, had instilled his beauty in nature. So if Spencer could take his cues from nature, then he would have the beauty of God. And not bad. So this is one of the pieces that I did, not only as a, as a nod to Spencerian script, but to show the place from which it was inspired. You see, he was inspired by the flowing lines he saw in the streams by his house, the gentle lean of the wheat blowing in the wind, and the rolling cloud mountain. And see, Spencer's form was not only genius in its appearance, but it was a thing of brilliance and function as well. You see, today, the way that we typically write is we plant our palm on the side of our hand, and we use a whole variety of horrible pen grips, and we write using mainly finger movements. And so this puts stress on all of the smallest uh, joints, muscles, tendons, and in the end, it results in what we know as writers. Well, back in the day, Platt Rogers Spencer devised that his handwriting should be written with the knuckles up towards the ceiling using muscular movement, which is movement at the wrist, and whole arm movement for those larger, graceful curves, so you could write all day long and never get writer's cramp. And there were others that followed in Spencer's pen strokes. This is Louis Madaraz, regarded as the greatest ornamental penman who ever lived. He built on Spencer's fundamental form to bring us some of the most dynamic scripts man, one of which is said to have inspired the Coca-Cola logo, one of the longest standing most dynamic logos of all time. Or this man, F.B. Courtney, the pen wizard, so called because of the magic created hip of his pen. It was said that Courtney, whenever he taught, would go into a room and fill a chalkboard with museum-worthy flourishing script. And then, at the end, he would take a piece of chalk in each hand, stand at the chalkboard, and sign his name simultaneously in opposite direction. Duck. Now I know what you're saying. Jake, this is all well and good, but I'm afraid my penmanship has sailed and sunk. I write in chicken scratch. I'm sorry, I was just not born with the natural facilities that these masters were. Well, let me encourage you a bit, and possibly make you feel worse about yourself. This is J.C. Ryan, the handless. He was a man born without hands who made his living. You see, these are the heroes of our past. These are the builders of our handwriting heritage. Newton said that we only reach great heights by standing on the shoulders of giants. I tell you that my hand only moves so gracefully as I've rehearsed. Use this, and you will develop intellectual literacy. Now, in college, I actually got my degree in psychology, largely because I did not think I was going to make it as an artist. Of course, I, I practiced my artwork and my handwriting incessantly, so much so that I gained a reputation among my professors um, who were handing around my uh, essay test, saying that they looked like the Declaration of Independence. Well, in one psychology course, I... Uh, which was cognitive psychology, we actually studied how handwriting helped develop the brain. I took copious... So, this is what I was talking about, the, how handwriting and uh, brain are connected, and every time you, you write something, it's more or great, and kind of, kind of supports more, like, if you're writing down certain something, that 
things more gets ingrained into, into your memory than if you were typing on a piece of uh um uh, if you're typing on a keyboard that's one thing and another thing you're uh, uh creating more uh neural synapses between the uh, parts of the brain more connectivity which is actually what makes uh men more intelligent and uses more uh, uh, bigger portion or bigger capacity of the brain and what we discovered when we studied this was that during the different tactile movements of doing handwriting, the brain is actually engaged in more areas and the information is brain brain. The same was not found to with typing, however, which does not involve the same type of differential tactile. Now, handwriting was also found to be incredibly helpful in small children who are learning to read because by forming the individual letters, they had a deeper understanding of the anatomy of each one and were therefore able to recognize when it came time to read it on the page and this is might be actually if you, if, if you were watching or actually uh, paying attention to, uh, to a previous video or the video i didn't see is that 70 between 50 and 70 percent of uh, of uh, of kids at age 10 are not being are not able to read and comprehend the uh adequate story for their age, something that they should have. Moreover, cursive was found to be even more benefit brain. Researchers and scientists have actually done brain scans on children learning cursive, found that the different parts of the brain which are engaged are similar to those that adults typically use when writing higher. The screen went blank when the kids were doing typing because it didn't involve type text. So let me point out the fact that not only has uh, technology brought us this amazing information, but in this case, it stands as the champion of handwriting. One thing we need to stop doing is putting technology and handwriting posing corner. People often assume that with my old ideals and ancient art forms, that I am somehow stuck past, and therefore I must hate technology. Let me assure you, I do not hate technology. In fact, I am a proud Apple user. I have an iPhone, iPad, iMac, MacBook. I have my own website, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And I drive around in a horseless carriage like everybody else. So don't try and tell me that I'm stuck in the past. Beyond acknowledging the fact that we are in a modern age, I do believe that typing is a very fundamental tool that children do need to learn. However, they should not be learning it at the expense of handwriting. You see... Thank you. you see, schools are leaning all the time more and more so on technology to help move kids down the conveyor belt of the educational system. But what we need to do is be a good steward of both and listen to what our technology is telling us. Pick up the pen, write it. You see, it is not technology that is the direct enemy of the pen. It is our dependent on technology. Okay, so to conclude uh, this uh, presentation, uh, this video, which is actually a series of uh, separate videos I made on uh, different topics or different uh, factors that contribute to why kids today are struggling with school. Let's make a, a conclusion or to, to summarize what we so far have mentioned in this video. So first, there was a segment with uh, Jen Twenge and uh, with study on smartphone uh, generation and how they are addicted uh, to using smartphones and how that affect them with uh, that uh, uh, being presented. Then I presented a um, study how during pandemics, uh, kids uh, suffered even more due to Zoom conference call, online studying, uh, schools were not uh, as good as uh, regular schools. Then we have a few studies that in today world of uh, social media, children are reading less and i wanted to conclude my overall understanding of the problem with the fact that in the first place public schools as such the way they were designed were not meant to nurture individual uh, creativity within the kids rather it uh, kind of uh, breeds some kind of a conformity and obedience and there are plenty of videos i'm just selecting a number of videos that i would recommend on that subject and there are many and i don't want to keep repeating something that's being uh, said over and over 
in uh, many books and in many uh, documentaries and in many videos that can be found on, on YouTube. Uh, first three uh, videos here, um, why public schools and mainstream media dumb us down. That's a video by the YouTube channel Academy of Ideas and public schools, uh, the fixation of belief in social control. Uh, that uh, is one of my favorite YouTube channels, but I wanted to focus on a specific part of this video, Public School, The Fixation of Belief and Social Control by, by the channel, uh, where there is a quotation by Taylor, where he explains what are the, the goals of uh, public education in the United States. And I will just continue the, the video for the, like just a small part of this video that is very, very instructive for, for a point I want to make. Frederick Taylor Gates, business advisor to John D. Rockefeller, who in 1903 founded the General Education Board, which provided major funding for schools and was a big supporter of state-controlled compulsory schooling, wrote in his 1913 book, The Country School of Tomorrow, In our dream, the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or of science. We are not to raise up from among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great artists, painters, musicians. Nor will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up from among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply. For the task that we set before ourselves is a very simple, as well as a very beautiful one, to train these people as we find them for a perfectly ideal life just where they are. An idyllic life under the skies and within the horizon, however narrow, where they first open their eyes. Let me put back that, uh, that text on the, on the screen. So the, the sentence here, we are not here to raise up from among them authors, uh, orators, poets or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo, great artists, painters and musicians. Nor we will cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply. So exactly this. If those in who are elites in between them are were at this point in time saying this, and I, I wouldn't say that anything changed in 120 years since this was written between uh, Frederick Taylor Gates and, and uh, John D. Uh, Rockefeller. This is exactly what, uh, what public schooling should be about. We should try to create authors, the writers, public speaker. So public speaking should be one of the, the, the things in the curriculum of uh, public schools or either in the primary school or definitely, if not in primary school, then in, uh, in the high school. We should try to create as many as poets as we can or men or letters who, were in, who know how to express themselves. So uh, subjects of uh, creative writing sh should be definitely next to uh, literature or uh, or just language courses that that are next to like supplement to to regular uh, classes uh, in uh, in language classes that we have in uh, primary school next to that i would say that, that we should definitely have in every every school debate teams and critical thinking classes as that that, that is i think uh, uh, one of one of those things that that is uh, lacking greatly in the uh, public schools ability to propose an argument which also works very well together into uh, being an orator a public speaker art of public speaking uh, knowing all those subjects is something th that is being taught greatly in uh, private schools where most of the elites are sending their kids to but is not being uh, taught in uh, public schools and among those subjects if I can also add a subject that it should be added to a public school curriculum, it should be chess, because chess in itself teaches uh, analysis, critical thinking, and many great things that are uh, 
that are important for somebody to be a conscious uh, uh, individual among those. So with that, with, with that being said, I would just uh, close this video about what is wrong and, uh, and why uh, kids are struggling today.